Hey everybody, my name is Jordan. Thank you so much for joining us at the church online. We would love to have you and your family join us right here at the church. For more information on what's available for you and your family at the church, check out welcometothechurch.com. Now, let's get started with today's message. Most of us in the room today um, have, have in some way, form, or fashion been, been raised in, in church. Maybe grandma and grandpa took you as, as a child, and maybe you went as a kid, and then maybe in their 20s, or maybe you've been attending for quite some time. Uh, most of us in the room today have some, some form of a church background um, and even though that's the case, and I want you to be really honest here, and ra- I want you to raise your hand, okay, if, if this is you, because my hand will be up, is have you ever wondered about what other religions actually believe? Have you ever wondered that before? Raise your hand, okay? Our salvation numbers are going to go up. Keep that. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Okay. Um, yeah, most of us, and, and, and I'll be honest with you, I think that's good because faith and the journey of faith is not a blind faith. That's not faith. That's, that's stupidity to do something blindly. There, there's, the, faith is the substance of things hoped for and it's the evidence of things unseen, that there's proofs to cause us to believe what we actually believe, and that's, that's faith. And in that faith journey, many times as we're deciding what journey we're going to take, or maybe we've, we've picked our lane of Christianity, even then, it's okay. You're just kind of curious. What do other religions actually believe? Whether it's, you know, Brad Pitt going up, taking up, you know, several years ago, he went up and talked to the Tibetan monks. monks. There's Kabbalah, there's Scientology, there's atheism, there's materialism, there's Buddhism, there's Hinduism, there's smokeweedism, there's all these different, <laughs> you know, there's all these different isms out there. And which, which one's which, what do they actually believe? And is there, is there a, a, a reason for us to believe as human society that in reality all of these roads, whether it's Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism or, or, or Christianity, is there a reason for us to believe that all of these roads, though different in some ways, actually take us to the same heaven and take us to the same God? Is there, is there, is there reasons for us to, to, to believe this philosophy in, in that? And then also, the question that we want to show and, and talk about today is, is there, knowing, knowing the worldview that we have, how should we then live? If this is our worldview, how should we live? So I, I want to ask you some questions. You, can, you, don't, you don't have to answer these out loud. But, this is just for yourself, do you believe, number one, that there's a creator God? That's the first thing to wrestle with. Do you believe that? Secondly, do you believe that this creator God is is actually absolute truth? That who he is, is truth itself. Do you believe that this creator God who is truth put this truth into scriptures, the canonized 66 books of the Bible, so that we can understand how life is supposed to live. Do you believe that? Do you believe that this book, the Bible, is the inspired word of God? And then lastly, do you believe that our sins have separated us from this creator God and that God, through this life, death, burial, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, now invites us to be his children? If you believe that, If you believe that there is a creator God, he is absolute truth, he put absolute truth in the inspired word of God, and that through the word of God, we now see that this creator God invites us to be his children through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you believe, if you would say in your heart, yes, to all of those things, you have what is known as a biblical worldview. You have a biblical worldview because... Everything I just said are the teachings of this book. Okay, this is that. So you have a biblical worldview. Now, most in the room probably know the term worldview. However, let me just say it in a very simple way. A worldview is this. A worldview is it's the lens in which you look through. So if I have a, a lenses that are clear, my view is clear. But if I put on lenses that are shaded brown, it's going to have that tint to it. If I put on lenses that are yellow, if everything's going to have a yellow tint. Your worldview is the lens 
in which you see everything in the world about. Your, your relationship with your wife, your relationship with your friends, your relationship with your boss, your relationship with money, your relationships in, sexual, in, in sexuality. Your, your, your worldview is the lens that you see everything through. Now, how you see things is also how you respond to them. And that's why your worldview is so, so, so important for you to actually know what, number one, I think, what your worldview is, but then in light of that also, what's the correct one? So what we want to do today is, is we want to take a look at the worldviews. Take a look at different worldviews. And we're going to look at them and compare them back to this Judeo-Christian worldview of the Bible to see if they actually are all the same, or are, are they different, and how do they differ? Because I actually think, especially in our society that we live in today, we as believers, this is something for us to know, understand, and be able to talk about in an educational way, not just, hey, brother, I'm a Christian. Why? Well, I went to church one time, and I felt the whole Holy Ghost heebie-jeebies. There must be a God. Well, that's awesome, and that's great, and that is viable in many ways, but if you have somebody who doesn't believe there is a God, you need to be able to talk to them in an educated manner. So this is very important for us to understand. So here we go. Today what we're going to do is, is we're going to break down worldviews in a few different lanes. Number one the, is God. What do they say about God? What do they say about humanity? What do they say about salvation? What do they say about authority? And what do they say about Jesus? So we're going to start off with the Bible today, okay? This is, the, this is what the Bible says about these things. Number one, the Bible, the 66 books of canonized scripture, the Bible says that there is one God in three persons that created the world, and he actually wants to be a part of our life. That's what the Bible teaches. There is one God in three persons that he created the world, and he wants to be a part of our life. Now, you see this all throughout the books. However, Genesis really explains this. The Gospel of John really explains this. We see all three in one. Colossians explains this. We see all three in one. But the Bible teaches there is one God and three persons who wants to be a part of our life. That's the Bible. The Bible also says about humanity, it says that humanity is fallen and that we need a Savior. Humanity is fallen and we need a Savior. We need redemption. We see this all throughout the Scripture, but especially in Romans 3, 23 and 24. It says there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by grace through redemption that came through Jesus Christ, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible teaches us that humanity is not good at heart, that humanity is actually broken at heart, and given a choice between right and wrong and apple and pizza, humanity will always will pick the pizza. Tell the truth and, and, and do the right thing, but do the wrong thing. A lot of times humanity is going to go towards the wrong thing as long as we don't get caught. And if we get caught, we know we will. We'll do the right thing. This is humanity. Humanity is broken. That's what Scripture says. The Bible also says about salvation that salvation can only be found in Jesus. Now, this is, this is where the rubber meets the road in Christianity. Christianity is not tolerant when it comes to salvation. Christianity and the Bible specifically says that salvation is found in and only in Jesus Christ. You see this all throughout scriptures, but especially in 1 John 5, 11, 12. Now, this, this, this last Wednesday in student ministry, we actually broke this down. We're doing a series called Foundations of Faith, and we walk through salvation and how you could be assured of salvation. And teenagers are memorizing 1 John 5, 11, 12, and here's what it says. And this is the testimony. That means it's the record. It's the truth. It's lock, stock, and barrel. Take, write the check, take it to the bank, and cash it, because then it's going to bounce. That's what he's saying. This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. This life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Scripture teaches that humanity has fallen and that we are in need of of redemption through a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus. Authority is found in the Bible. Scripture says about itself that all Scripture is God-breathed and it is able to instruct, to correct us for righteousness so that we will be able to do every good work. Our authority, Scripture says, comes from 
the Bible and the Bible alone. 66 books written by more than 40 authors over a span of 1,500 years, most of which never met. However, they're all saying the same thing. It's an odd thing. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. And then lastly, and this is my favorite part, the Bible says about Jesus, this person Jesus. In the Old Testament, it says, it shows through Genesis through Malachi or Malachi, if you're Italian. Genesis through Malachi. That's a, that's a Christian joke. If, you know, never mind. Okay. It's, it's, it's Genesis through Malachi. Is, it shows us that the Messiah is coming. It literally prophesies it around 400 plus times, but it also through foreshadowing and the stories of it, it shows that it gives a foreshadowing of the Messiah coming. So the Old Testament says the Messiah is coming. The New, the New Testament says the Messiah is here and his name is Jesus and he's going to live a perfect life. He's dying a brutal death and good news, he's going to save you and take you to heaven one day. That's what the Bible says about Jesus. It says that the Old Testament says that Jesus is coming the New Testament says he is here, he's going to save you, and he's going to take you to heaven. That's what the Bible says. Now that, when you attest to those views of God, Scripture, Jesus, authority, all of those things, then you have a biblical world view. Now let's take a look at some others. Hinduism. Hinduism has around 851 million followers in the world today. 851 million, right around there. Hinduism teaches about God that there is not one God, but there are more than 3.3 million gods. So the Bible says there's one God and three persons who wants to be involved in your life. Hinduism says, no, there's not one God, there's 3.3 million gods. Okay? Hinduism says about humanity... I'll just read, what, read this. You can read it on screen as well. Hindus believe in something that is not a creature or a being, but it's a force, much like Star Wars, um, this thing called the absolute. Each human has a piece or pieces of the absolute inside of them, and these pieces of the absolute long to be reunited at some point with the absolute. So Hindus teach that humanity have this thing inside of us that this force known as the absolute has placed inside of us, and there's something inside of us that wants to be one with this at some time. That's what it says about humans. Salvation comes through a repeating cycle of reincarnation in order to remove all bad karma. And once bad karma is removed and the scales are tipped in, into our favor, where good karma outweighs bad karma, the person then becomes one with the absolute. That's Hinduism theology. Authority, where do Hindus believe all of this? Where do they get the authority to say there's 3.3 million gods, the authority to say there's an absolute inside of every human that longs to be part? Where, where, where do they get that authority? Their authority comes from the teachings of the four Vedas, which were passed down orally, not in writing. They're, they're oral teachings uh, from the 3.3 million gods down to humanity, and hum humans talk amongst themselves about the, four, the teachings of the four Vedas. Jesus some sects of Hindus believe that he was simply a good guru. Others believe that he's an avatar. Yes, avatar. He's an avatar of the god named Vishnu. Um, Vishnu is when you see the Hindu, when you go sometimes in restaurants and you see a blue god that's sitting down with a yellow beanie on and he has many hands, that's Vishnu. Uh, Hindus believe that Jesus and Vishnu, they're the same thing. Um, now, when you compare that, one god, 3.3 million gods, Humanity is lost. No, humanity just wants to be one with the absolute. Authority is the teachings, the written teachings of, of 40 men over the course of, six, uh, uh, of 1,500 years. No, it's actually oral teachings from the 3.3 million gods. These are totally different things. They're, 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 they're not even going to the same place, not even, let alone the same God, let alone the same heaven. There is no heaven with Hindus, it's the absolute force. So they're completely different. When you look at B Buddhism, I, I love Buddhism. I don't love Buddhism, but I love this story. Um, I told this story before. In around 563 BC, there was this queen, um, this queen named Maya. And Queen Maya gave birth to a child, and she named him Siddhartha Gautama. 
And Queen Maya gave birth to Siddhartha Gautama around 563 BC. But here's the oral teachings of this, that when Queen Maya did her final push and Siddhartha came out into the arms of the midwives, the midwives did not put, her, put him on the, the chest of Queen Maya. The boot, uh, um, Siddhartha actually stood up and they laid him on the ground and he stood up. He took seven steps. He stopped and said, this is my final birth. I have been born to save humanity. Then he turned around and walked back to his mom. Now, for a guy who's seen four children be born, may I just say that is just a little bit freaky, right? <laughs> Good night, nursery school. Sit down, take seven steps. Hello there. My, no, well, no, this is crazy, right? But that's the oral te- uh, teachings and Siddhartha Gautama eventually grows into the Buddha. Buddhists teach about God like Hindus, that they recognize the force of the absolute, and they also say that there are many gods, but there are also demons. And however, these gods and demons should not be worshipped because they are actually just re- they are people in states of reincarnation. Buddhists teach about humanity, um, much like all creatures on the planet Earth uh, are on Uh, path to enlightenment. Humans and animals are all the same, so Buddhists refuse to take a life of any form, and they're vegetarians because they believe that this animal is actually someone who used to be a relative that's being in, in a path of enlightenment and being reincarnated. That's why they don't eat meat. The authority, that the reason they believe all of the things that they believe comes from the words of Buddha, passed down 300 years after his death. So Buddha lives, he teaches, he dies, 300 years after his death, these teachings are are now recorded in what's known as the Sutra. When it comes to salvation, salvation is available to anyone who walks the path of Buddha and live by the eightfold path, reincarnating after death in order to remove all bad karma. Once they have completed the path, they are transcended into a state of nirvana. That's the teachings of Buddhists. And Jesus Jesus was Buddha reincarnated. So let's take a look. One God, three persons wants to be involved in your life. No, there's many gods. However, none of them are to be worshipped because they're actually humans in the states of different reincarnation. Jesus is the path and the way to life. No, Jesus was actually Buddha reincarnated. Authority comes from Scripture written within 30 years after the death of, the, of Jesus Christ himself in the New Testament. No, authority comes from the teachings of the Buddha, which were written more than 300 years after his death, known as the Sutra. Once again, these are apples to oranges. They're, 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 they're not even close to the same. And let's wrap up with this part of Islam. Islam is by far the fastest growing religion in the world today. Its followers are known as Muslims. When it comes to God... Uh, Muslims teach, Islam teaches that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. This is known as the Shahada, and it is what Islam is founded on. Allah is so, the teachings of Islam say that Allah is so good, he is so powerful that he refuses to even recognize the teachings, or, or excuse me, recognize humans. Humanity exists to do the bidding of its master, Allah. Authority comes from the Quran, which again is oral teachings written more than 100 years after the death of Muhammad. Salvation is believing in the Shahada and living by the five pillars of Islam. And Jesus was one of many prophets from Allah, but he did not die on the cross, and he is not the Savior. So when you look at these paths, all of these are legitimate religious paths that people legitimately believe in. When you look at these, we have to admit to ourselves, one God, 3.3 million gods, on the path to heaven, on the path to enlightenment. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way, the truth, and the life. No, there's many ways to get back up to the absolute It is impossible. One of my favorite things to do is to go to a buffet bar. I love going to a buffet bar because it is a complete contradiction. You can go to a buffet bar. One of my 
My wife hates this place, but I like it. It's Howie and Sons. Remember how you know Howie and Sons in town, right? You go to Howie and Sons, you've got greasy, somewhat sugary, which is odd, but greasy, sugary pizza, these greasy potatoes, this deep fried chicken. Good God, I'm hungry. This is good stuff. But now you also have a salad. You got a nice salad bar. And at one buffet bar, you can go greasy truck stop rock gut. And also, I'll have a nice little petite salad. <laughs> and that's the nice thing about a food buffet bar is you can go healthy and junk all at the exact same time, and it's one buffet bar. When it comes to faith, I want you to listen to me. There is no religious buffet bar. Religion is not a buffet bar. It can't be a, a religious buffet bar because they are all so different. One says there's one God, one says there's 3.3 million, one says humanity has fallen, the other says no, humanity has this force inside of it that longs to be part of the force. One says we're going to go be reunited with our God in heaven, another one says no, there is no heaven, you just become one with the universe. We, it, to say I am a Christian, but I'm also a Buddhist, I'm a Buddhist but also live by the teachings of Allah, we can't. They're not believing in the same God or gods. They're not going to the same place by their own teachings. We can't say, we can't live by, and this is where a lot of our culture is, is, well, that works for you, it works for me, we're all going to the same place. We can't because Hindus don't even believe in the place that we say we're going, and we say our God is the one God, and they say there's 3.3 million gods. It's like saying, you know what? I love the Raiders. Oh, the Raiders! But my favorite quarterback is Jimmy G for the 49ers. I love Jimmy G. Give me some Jimmy G, but I love the Raiders. Go, Jimmy. You can't be a Raiders fan and root for Jimmy Garoppolo. You can't be. You, 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 you can't. It's, I, I, it's that just even the concept of that throws me off. Like, how is this even, how is it? And we all know this. You can't be a Raiders fan and also root for the quarterback of the 49ers. You can't say, I am a staunch vegetarian. I, listen, I'm a vegetarian. But dang, my favorite meal is a ribeye. <laughs> Blood red in the middle. <laughs> oh, but I'm a vegetarian. You know what? I'll have my steak medium rare. Thank you. You can't be a vegetarian and eat steak. Okay? You can't. And we can't, we as a culture, we as humanity, and this is where nobody, because we are so afraid of commitment in the United States of America. We're afraid to commit. We have to pick a lane. We have to put on a pair of glasses and say, my worldview is Christian. And if my worldview is a biblical worldview, I can't also try and look at the world through the lens of a Hindu. Because a Hindu lens is not the same as a Christian lens. It looks completely different. And how we see things is how we live towards things. And so I want us to understand when it comes to the religions of this world, even though I would honestly say that people who follow all religions have a desire in their heart in some way, form, or fashion to do what's right or else they would not commit themselves to such a path. So I'm not questioning the desire to try and find what's right. But we have to, first and foremost, you got to pick what's your view. Because you can't have Howie and Sons when it comes to faith. I might have it today after church, but you can't have it when it comes to faith, right? So that's the first thing. And if you believe what we said at the beginning, that there is one God and three persons who wants to be a part of our life, that humanity is fallen and in need of a savior, that we believe what we believe because of the teachings of this library of books, and that Jesus is the only way to heaven, you have a biblical worldview. So if that's the view that you have, if you would say yes and amen to all those things, and I 
I don't really know about this force deal. That ain't setting with me. I, I see it this way. If, that's how, if this is how you see it, what should you do now? What should you do? What should we do? If this is, if this is the lens that we are looking through, in, in light of my worldview, what should I do? Jesus, Jesus tells us this. And Jordan talked about it last week, but this, the, it's so basic. It's so basic, but man, it's, it's also so tough. He says this in, in the book of Mark, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. You see, this is the, this is the thing that, that differentiates us as Christians from from any other religion in the world. You see, when it comes to religion, religion is a, um, it's a belief in or a worship of a superhuman controlling power, especially a god or gods. Religion is a particular system of faith of worship. It's, religion is I have a system that I am walking out to appease this god or this force of some sort And if I do enough good, I eventually get rewarded by this force or get rewarded by this God. Allah, Allah from Islam, Vishnu from Hinduism, Buddha, is if I do, they'll smile on me. That's religion. Christianity, even though we have steps that we take, it is very different than other religions because the steps that we take, we don't take them so that God will smile on us. We take those steps because he already has. We don't do what we do as Christians so that we can be saved. We do what we do as Christians because we are are already saved. See, Christianity is different in religions because it's at the core and the heart of what Christianity actually is, is it's truly not a religion as much as it is a relationship. Because there, there's four different types of relationships. One is romantic. One is an acquaintance. You know, I, I, see, I see this. There's a guy at Walmart who checks out all the time. He always sees the guy that always goes, Doot. thanks for coming, boss. He always calls me boss. I don't know why. Doot. Thanks for coming, boss. That guy's an acquaintance. I've said hi to him. I've talked to him. You know, he's an acquaintance. I see him sometimes. There's acquaintances. Then there's friends. People that we work with, people that we hang out with from time to time. We see at church or at small group. Those are friends. But the fourth level is family. It's blood. The fourth level is family. It's blood relationship. And in Christianity, God does not call us to be his acquaintance. God does not call us to be his friend. God, through the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, has now invited us to be his what? His children. And there is no blood bond stronger than the bond between a parent and their child. And Christianity says, this God in heaven says, come, let's be family. And now when you're in the family, you guys remember growing up, when you're in the family, there's chores that you do just because you're in the family. And you do them, why? Because you're in the family. You don't do them to be in the family, Well, if you make your bed and you do this and you do that and you don't go here and you don't go over there, then by golly, you can be my kid. That's not how it works. Is you are my kid, so because of that, I'm asking you to make your bed, to do this, to don't go there, to don't go that. That's completely different than any other religious expression. All other religious expressions say, if you do this and you do this and you do this and you do this, then maybe we can hang out together. God says, I am coming to you. I am dying for you. I am making you be my child through my own blood. We are now blood relationship. And because we're family, would you mind loving me? And would you mind loving your brothers and sisters the same way? Let's be family. And I think in the world in which we live, I think that's what our world needs. It's less acquaintances, less friendships, and more family. And that's what Christianity offers. 
that we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. And as we come to him, like Jordan said last week, and as we come to him and say, Dad, how do I, what do you want me to do? And then we listen, and then we just obey. As we make that a pattern of our life, what will happen is we'll begin to love our neighbor as ourself. So today in closing, here's how we're going to wrap this up. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, it talks about that Abraham, through faith, did these things. That Esther, through faith, did these things. That Noah, through his faith in God, did these things. And the list goes on and on and on and on of people who had faith in God and that faith in God drove them to do. And oh, that would be my prayer for you, us as individuals, that we would understand what our worldview is, that there is one God. I am broken. God loved me enough to send Jesus. I know this through the word, and now I can have a father in heaven, a family in heaven through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And as I have that as my worldview, I look up to my father now and I say, like Jordan asked last week, what do I do? What do I do? And then I listen. And he might say, start doing this. Stop doing that. He might say, make this phone call, get something right. But as we come to him and say, Father, what do we do? Our neighbors begin to feel the love of God through us. And our world becomes a better place. And I think that's what Christianity, that's what it's all about. So today, I don't, I'll be honest with you, I don't, I don't have two things for you to do other than challenging yourself, is this your worldview? And if it is, come to Father God and ask him, what would you have me do? Listen, and then obey. Because there is no smorgasbord, there is no religious buffet. You can't have everything in all the religions. But you can have everything through God. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name for your goodness and grace today. Thank you, sir, that you love us the way that you do. Lord, we come to you and we thank you. You, you have made the path so clear in your word. But like anything in life, we have to, we have to go to it. We, you came to us. Now it's our turn to come to you. And God, I pray in Jesus' name that we would that we would begin to really study your word. And God, what, what do you say about yourself? What do you say about humanity? What do you say about salvation? What do you say about Jesus? And how does that apply to my life? Because if this is truly what we believe, then we'll do something. Not to be saved, but because you saved us. So God, help us to wrestle with this. Help us to walk this out. And if there's people in our life that we know that are inquisitive, let us even go back and watch this again. Find out how we can talk to them about our faith and why we believe what we believe. And help us to do something with it. And Holy Spirit, I, I trust you. I don't have to tell these individuals what to do. Holy Spirit, you will. I believe you already are. You're telling them what to do. And God, help us in light of our worldview to listen to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey everyone, once again, thank you for taking some time out of your day to join us at the church online. So glad that, that, that you were with us today. Here's the deal, if this topic made you think today, or over the last couple of weeks, some of the other topics that we've mentioned has got your mind going and you would like to talk to someone. Maybe it's not even about the topic. Maybe you just have a need in your life and you'd like to connect with someone here at the church uh, to just talk. We would love to connect with you. So here's the deal. Email us at info at welcome to the church.com and we would love to set up a time to maybe either talk on the phone or set up a time to grab a coffee and get to know each other personally. We would love to connect with you. So again, email us at info at welcome to the church.com if you'd like to connect. We'd love to connect with you.